Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. Welcome devotees to the morning Bhagavatam class. Happy Kartik to each and every one of you. It's my um, great fortune to be with all of you and especially Kartik, um, which His Holiness Chandramali Swami. Thank you so much, Marsh, for giving me this opportunity to serve you and everyone else on this beautiful month of Kartik. Would like to let devotees know that Maharaj is continuing a beautiful chapter um chapter canto 10 chapter 9 and the chapter is entitled the summum bonum and the, this chapter is entitled the canto is entitled summum bonum the chapter is entitled mother yashoda binds lord krishna and marge is going to be continuing with verse 3 and we welcome all of you hi krishna Maharaj. please accept my humble obeisances yes. to you at august of Prabhupada. Yes. March, I can see you, March, but somehow I think because it's the time of the day, you're a little bit in the dark. Let me see if I can put some light here. I'm yeah, we gonna... need some light on you, March. Yeah, I'm in a new place and I'm still getting accustomed to the ambulance here. Okay, I do like that. No problem. Um, Oh yeah, a little better. Oh yes, a little better. Definitely now we can see you, Marge. Thank you so much. I saw something and now I see something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The angle of the light. Oh, the yeah. angle. Yes, yes. Now it's much, much better. Oh yes, perfect. So, yes, uh, I went from the ghetto to Spargaloka. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm trying to think the ghetto and the Svargaloka, how it is, but I guess it's it's something to experience, Maharaj. <laughs> That's only in terms of living conditions. <laughs> Krishna. The, the ghetto was pretty nice. <laughs> Actually, the background looks so much like Svargaloka, I think, so I, I do see your point, nice big buildings and houses and trees. Yeah, this is the this is the Swaga Loka of my apartment. Well, somebody gave me their apartment, so I took it. Oh, that's wonderful. I moved it there. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as you're comfortable, Maharaj. But as we know in our philosophy, anyone who attains Swaga Loka, pious activities do run out after some time. <laughs> so I have to fall back down. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> but it's nice that they gave that to you, Maharaj, for your stay. That's so wonderful. Wow. Maharaj, I, I was just made, I, I was asked if you could please, please come closer to the laptop. That's what they are saying. Srimati is saying to please come closer to the laptop. <laughs> I can do that by moving the laptop. Okay. <laughs> oh, that. yes. And she's saying the sound is not clear for her. I, th I think it sounds a little bit deep, a little bit deep. Can you hear? All right. Yeah. Is that better, Srimati? I'm, I'm waiting for her. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances on Rosh Hashanah. Yes, Guru Maharaj, I think, um, yeah, you were a little far away from the laptop. Uh, that's why it was like that. I'm, I'm about. About eight inches from the left side. Right now. Actually, I now I... you're better. Yeah, I think. Yes, yes. I can't get any closer without getting <laughs> my eyeballs in the screen become one and non different here. <laughs> <laughs> no, good, Maharaj. This is fine. Thank you. And okay. I don't think we want to merge into the laptop, Maharaj. <laughs> Some people would like that as they consider that successful. <laughs> <laughs> It's all that, yours, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Srimati, <laughs> <laughs> what is what is the verse for Thursday? Send it to me on my email. It's good, Maharaj. I will give you it. It's Maharaj. I will give you. Yes, Send it on, the, on my WhatsApp for Thursday's class. 
Yes, Gurmash. Yes, I agree. Okay. Komedian Timiran Bersia, Gena Gena Salakaya, Chetu Un Militam Nona Tres Naishu, Dirabay Namaha, Nama Un Vishnu, Adai Krishna Tres Naya Vitaraj, Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine, Namaste Saraswati Deva Gauravani Pacharana, Nirvase Sasunyavadi Pachat Yudu Sakana, Vanshakopa Paduri Pacha, Vipasindu Pei Pacha Paditanam Pavane Gyo, Vaishnave Gyo Namaho Namaha, Vaisi Krishna Kaitan of the Bundestan on the Tree of Vay to get that far as she wants to be more about the women. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. On this most spiritually beneficial month of the year known as the Dhammadhan month, in the era time of Kartik, um, we center our attention around Krishna and his form as a baby, performing his most uh, amazing and most mysterious leela of uh, stealing butter and getting tied up. So yesterday we began with the first two verses, and today we'll do verse number three from chapter nine of Canto Ten. Yao mum vasapritikata tabhidrati sutanandam. Putra Sena Sutta Kachu, Yuga Jat, the Kanta Chasubru, Raja Karsan Smaram Bujan, Kala Tamkano Kundalamcha, Kinam Rakam Kabara, Vidam Malati Mir Mamanta. Dressed in her saffron yellow sari with belt towel around her full health hips, Mother Yasoda pulled on the churning rope, laboring considerably, her bangles and ears moving and vibrating, her whole body shaking. Because of her intense love for her child, her breasts were wet with milk, her face with the very beautiful eyebrows, with wet with perspiration. And malati flowers were falling on her hair. <laughs> her point, anyone who desires to be Krishna consciousness and motherly affection or parental affection should contemplate the bodily features of Mother Yasoda. It is not that one should desire to become like Mother Yasoda, for this is Mayavad, either in parental affection or kinds of the love, friendship, or servitude. If in any way one was following the footsteps of the inhabitants of Vrindavan and not trying to become like them, therefore this description is provided here. Advanced devotees must cherish this description, always thinking of Mother Yasoda's features, how she was dressed, how she was working and perspiring, how beautifully the flowers were arranged in her hair, and so on. One should take advantage of full description provided here by thinking of Mother Yasoda in maternal affection for Krishna. Shamaam Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Pastaya Bhutale, Shumakti Bhakti Vedam Kusmami Kinamine, Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gaunavani Pachari Mamir Vise Sasun Yavadi, Pasyatya Vesitani. So there is a terminology called ras. Ras, the word rasa does not have an English translation that will fully describe the meaning of the word ras. But the closest that the uh, English Vaishnavas give, the acharyas, is the word mellow. <laughs> mellow means something that is sublime and sweet. Uh, sometimes that word is used in a very ordinary way to say, well, that was really mellow. It means it was very calming and very soothing and very pleasing. So the word rasa, in, in its broader sense, means to connect in a certain mood or mellow. 
with Krishna. <laughs> There's no other way the rasa could be described. There's no connection with any other living entity than Krishna. You can't say, well, I have a rasa with my wife. <laughs> I have a rasa with my, uh, my family members. These are not real rasas. Because they're, we might say in the best sense of the terminology, they're perverted senses of the original the sense of rasa, which simply is centers around relationships with Krishna. And they're a prime, prime, uh, prime uh, rasas, five prime, uh, primary, primary rasas. <clears throat> and 12 secondary rasas. The secondary rasas act like a catalyst to give a greater sense of mood to the primary rasas. And both of these categories of rasas are the complete way by which one interacts with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. There's nothing outside of these 12 or five rasas with seven supplementary or secondary moods. And they are mm -hmm. Shantaras, which means neutrality or passivity. Uh, Dasyaras means performing service. Sakyaras means developing a friendly relationship with Krishna. And mm -hmm. Vatsalyaras, the word Vatsalya is interesting in the Sanskrit word, because the word Vatsa means calf. And so the word Vatsaya really indicates a cow's love for her, for her calf. That's why the word Vatsaya is there. So the motherly affection for a cow, for her calf, is, some, is really the ideal loving mother-child uh, relationship. Uh, the mother, when she, after she gives birth to her calf, she takes care of her calf very carefully. And if she's separated from her calf, she actually becomes mad. She becomes really um, unmanageable. And unfortunately, that's what the demons do. They like to separate the calves from the calf. So the calves don't drink all of the milk. But the milk of the calf for them, for his the milk of the cow for him, for her calf. <clears throat> is actually the love of the cow for their, his, her child. And that also applies in human life or in any motherly-child relationship because you see that before the child is born, there is no... Um, uh, there's no milk in the mother's breast. But as soon as that child is born, the milk is provided by God, by, by, nature, by nature, through the organization of God. But the love for the mother blossoms at the time of the child's birth. And therefore, that inspires the milk to come into the breast and at the same time provides for the nourishment of the child. So we can actually say, and you can see it here too, that uh, Mother Yasoda, because she had such love for Krishna, she had so much uh, milk to provide for her son. The pastime, and we'll, we'll speak about the pastime on the actual day, of the pastime's performance, it's out on the Diwali day, which is, I'm not sure of the day of the month, but it's coming up within a week or so. On the Diwali day, um, Krishna performed this particular pastime. But in that Leela, it's explained that Mother Yasoda was, was um, offering her breast milk to Krishna, and at one point, she had put some milk on the stove. Now, the milk on the stove was another feature of Mother Soda's love for Krishna. 
because she had taken the best milk available out of all of her cows. Her son was 24. And she had cooked nicely and put it on the stove for Krishna. And then she was cooking the milk. But at that time, Krishna came out of his room. And Mother Yasoda was, and we've heard from the previous verse, she was churning butter so nicely and her hips were shaking and her breasts were bouncing and her, uh, and she was singing poetic and, and very musical expressions of glorification of Krishna in such beautiful meters and in uh, her bangles on her arms and her, her wrists were moving along with her journey and providing a background music to her singing. It was such a beautiful sight and Krishna immediately became eager to get the milk of his mother. So he ran out of the room and jumped on her lap after he saw her churning. She immediately stopped the churning and, and started to attend to Krishna. And here we see, and he explains that here, what was actually happening. She was wet with perspiration. Her breasts were wet with milk. Malati flowers were falling in her hair. And Krishna was so happy. He was enjoying the love of his mother in the form of her milk. And But on the stove, the milk was also being cooked, which was also for Krishna. And Mother Shisoda did everything for Krishna. She could not think of better not doing anything for her beloved little child who captured her attention 24 hours a day. And uh, and the milk was being cooked, but then the milk, and this is Jiva Goswami's interpretation, or actually not interpretation, but proper understanding. He said the milk started to feel neglected, the milk on the stove. And it was the milk was thinking, boy, Mother Yasoda, she has so much love for her son Krishna. And I'm here being cooked for Krishna. And Krishna is taking the milk of his mother. And because she has so much love, she has so much milk, that I'll never get used for Krishna. And then the milk was feeling bad. And so the milk decided to boil over. And as Jiva Goswami says, the milk was splashing on the stove, thinking, what is the use of my existence? Therefore, let me end my existence by boiling over and splashing on the stove. And that, of course, that caught the attention of Mother Yasoda. And then she put Krishna down, pretended a milk in it. Krishna was in a different mood now. He said, where did my mother go? <laughs> it's like, you might think, well, you're all of a sudden, you're in an ecstatic hair time. And you're dancing and you're chanting and you're feeling the ecstasy of the holy name as it permeates the entire room and everyone is in that mood. And all of a sudden, it just stops for no reason, right in the middle of the ecstasy. <laughs> and you think, ah, <laughs> it's like the worst thing that could possibly happen. But so I'm using that as an analogy just to help us understand how Krishna felt when you get a little idea of how Krishna felt when his mother left him and to tend to the milk on the stove. Now, Mother Yasoda's love for Krishna, as Prabhupada says here, should be understood by observing the affection that she had and how she carried out that affection. And this is interesting because it's a nice um, um, example of how a mother will show love for her child. So here it says that anyone who desires to be Krishna conscious in motherly affection and then, of course, Prabhupada, he, Prabhupada goes on to extend it and said, parental affection. She is the ideal mother in all sense of the terms, qualified in so many ways in her 
affectionate for her son, and at the same time, very expert in taking care of Krishna, and at the same time, very expert for arranging the household in such a way that everything is set up nicely for the pleasure of Krishna. So Prabhupada said one should contemplate and also the bodily features of Mother Yasoda and how she was so much, she was fully engaged body, mind, and uh, senses fully in glorification of the Lord. And this is the process of bhakti. If we can extend this analogy to bhakti in its, in its actuality, that if you really understand how to taste the happiness of Krishna consciousness, get absorbed. Whatever you're doing in Krishna can consciousness, whether it's cooking, cleaning, uh, offering some puja, or you know, just uh, doing some menial services, any 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 activity in devotional service, if we become absorbed in it, it becomes a, a great sense of happiness and satisfaction. It gives a sense of satisfaction that cannot be compared to anything. Why? Because it's centered around Krishna. It's centered around devotion to Krishna. Therefore, devotees know, especially when we chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we want to acquiesce as much attention and absorption in the Holy Name based on our, our desire to fully taste the sweetness of the Holy Name. And devotees always try to control the mind by absorbing the mind in devotional service. And any activity in devotional service, as Prabhupada has illustrated, is on the absolute platform. He makes one point where one devotee was um, indicating that you know, the word menial service which seems to be a lesser form of service. Prabhupada didn't really appreciate that statement because one who is on the transcendental platform knows that service is the absolute principle. And therefore, it's not so much the type of service that one does, it is the service itself that is transcendental. So anything in relationship with, so therefore, we can get absorbed even when we uh, take care of our bodily needs in such a way that it becomes an expression of our, of our need in order to serve Krishna nicely. So devotees are perfectionists. Devotees want to do everything in the best possible way. Just like when Prabhupada came to the United States, he didn't have much paraphernalia, and he carried all his stuff in the, in, the, in the trunk, the metal trunk. And then he used that metal trunk as his desk when he um, got to um, mm -hmm. New York. So he didn't have a formal desk, he had a metal trunk. But on that metal trunk, he, he placed everything on the top that he needed. And he had his pen, he had a picture of his spiritual master, he had his books, uh, he had his writing paraphernalia, he had his typewriter. Whatever he needed, he had on that trunk. Now, devotees would come sometimes when Prabhupada was away and clean. And they would clean very nicely. And they would sometimes move Prabhupada's stuff on his desk. And when they would put it back, they would put it back in a different place than when it was before. And Prabhupada would, uh, would indicate, no, it doesn't belong there. One time, someone used Prabhupada's pen. Prabhupada looked at me used the pen. And when they put it back on the desk, they put it in a different place. Prabhupada said, no, here. So Prabhupada, had, Prabhupada was very meticulous and doing everything so nicely, so carefully 
so concentratedly that watching Srila Prabhupada was like, like watching a, uh, a mystic, mystic yoga who was absorbed in mysticism. He was so precise in everything he did. And uh, this was even when he, one time he, he uh, had to give a, some money to one devotee and he had to take it from his pouch. So he picked up the pouch very deftly, he used the word deftly, D-E-F-T-L-L-E-Y, put his hand inside the pouch, picked up the coin, took it out in a very, uh, when we say graceful way, and then handed it to the devotee. <laughs> There was a picture watching Prabhupada put his finger in his pouch, pick up the coin, and hand it to the devotee. That's even recorded, that, that statement. And of course, those who saw that thought, this is like, and this is like pure ballet. <laughs> it was just so graceful. And Prabhupada was like that. And because Everything he did for Krishna was done in, in a very sweet and very concentrated and very precise way. Poetry in motion, very good uh, you know, title for Prabhupada's movie. So yeah, the Prabhupada was like that. So he taught, and here what Prabhupada is saying, one should observe or contemplate the bodily features of Maria's soul. And then if one wants to become like Navarro Soda, but Prabhupada makes the point, we can never become Navarro Soda. Because Navarro Soda, if she's an eternal associate of Krishna and the spiritual world, who again appears in the material world, in her feature, in her original feature, to take part in Krishna's pastimes in and uh, <clears throat> Bhumi Vrindavan or Vrindavan material world. But the Mayavadis, their idea is that if you follow the Guru, you become the Guru. If you worship the Lord, then you actually become the Lord. So the idea is that their whole idea of Spirituality means to become the object of your worship. But that is not our that is called Maya God. Maya means Maya means illusion and God really means a type of philosophy centered around illusion. So no one can become other than so but one can follow in the footsteps. Prabhupada says there is a new on and a new on. Anus Karan means to follow in the footsteps, means to learn from the great souls and learn how they serve the Lord and make that a focus in your own life. You pray to such persons, such as Mother Yasoda, and uh, glorify them, make them the object of your devotion also, and you worship them, pray to them, glorify them, learn from them, and then you can develop some of the qualities that they have also like that, and also receive their special mercy. And that can be done with any of the great souls. You know, like Su Sudan or, uh, you know, or um, Kinkini or um, Ujwala or Subal. Three down in friendship, in servitorship, Mother Yasoda, Nanda Maharaj, or Sachi Mata and Jagannath Mishra, in Madhurya Ras, in Malita, in Shaka. We can also, Radharani is unique in her. And those who follow Radharani have to be in that mood of Radharani also. That's 
that's a very high level of Anut Paran. But there are examples of that. Shivaram Maharaj has just recently, uh, I think tomorrow, he'll come to the UK and release his new, new book called Vilaja Kusmanjali, which is actually um, some, um, Raghunath Dasko Swami. Raghunath Dasko Swami is Rati Manjari in the spiritual world. He appeared in this world as one of the six world Swamis of Vindana. But in his service in the spiritual world as Rati Manjari, he takes personal care of Srimati Radharani. And in his love for Srimati Radharani, there is and his mood as Raghunath Das Swami revealing his inner mood of Rati Manjari. He has composed these beautiful, beautiful series of verses glorifying his service to Srimati Radharani and Radharani in that service. So Hiraram uh, is just taking some of the verses and made it into the first volume of his expression of Vilaja Pusu Manjali. And uh, it's a recommended read for devotees because it'll teach you the mood of Madhurya Ras in the spiritual world. And again, we also caution those who read such literatures to be aware that um, don't try to place, put yourself in the same position as uh, Rati Manjari or, or uh, uh, Raghunath Dasgur Swami. We can just simply appreciate and learn from their loving relationship with the Supreme Personality of God, and in this case, Timothy Radharani, who is non different than Krishna. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is mood of Anush Charan following in the footsteps is a recommended way to move forward in our spiritual life and come to the platform of spontaneous love for Krishna. And the other side is Anusharan. Anusharan thinks that uh, to imitate such personalities and think that by imitating, I can become like. That is called Sahatya, it's cheap. And it means that if I imitate uh, ecstatic symptoms, that means I have ecstatic symptoms. And there are a class of devotees who like to perform some imitation. Uh, Sri Devi will answer your question. Sorry. Uh, there is a class of uh, Sahajus who like to put on a show of ecstatic symptoms. Uh, you didn't give the whole name, you just gave the one word, two words. Mm -hmm. And these class of people are they're just show bottle devotion. They have no real devotional life. And they like to make a show of devotion. Uh, there was times when, <laughs> when they would come and they would uh, perform their show for Srila Prabhupada, try to impress Srila Prabhupada by their so-called devotion to Krishna. So one of them came to Vrindavan when Prabhupada was there in the Krishna Balaram and there. And uh, he came in front of Prabhupada and he just came. Somehow he, he got in Prabhupada's room. And then he fell to the ground and started rolling on the ground and trying to express some, some ecstatic symptoms. And Prabhupada turned to one of his <laughs> assistants and said, just kick him. <laughs> And so the devotee, very dutifully following the instructions of the spiritual master, who gave the, uh, the sahajya a little kick, and the man got up and ran away. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of cheapness in there. Or they'll, they'll do a performance, and then what happens? Well, once they do their performance, uh, they'll go out and smoke some cigarettes right afterwards. 
Studies are called Sahajians, those who take it cheaply. They like to imitate ecstatic symptoms. Um, imitation is cheap. Anybody can perform imitation. To actually develop real qualities of devotion, one has to seriously engage in devotion and service, chant the holy names with full attention, serve the spiritual master with full absorption, and worship the Lord and serve the Vaishnavas and understand everything through the teachings of the spiritual master in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, Chaitanya Charitamrita, nectar of devotion. So it's a process, not something that you can imitate. Sometimes devotees think, well, because I have a particular name, I'm just like that person whose name I get. <laughs> I'm lame. So someone like you named after Lord Shiva. So they think, well, maybe I'm an, ex you know, an incarnation of Lord Shiva or an expansion of Lord Shiva or an hunger of Lord Shiva. Or, or someone gets the name of Sri Mati Radharani and thinks that they're in that's wrong, Namrata. That name is wrong. Um, uh, honestly, you put the right name. Up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, don't fall into that misconception just because you have a particular name doesn't mean you're, uh, uh, you know, you're in the, you're the incarnation of a particular person. <laughs> We can get like that. <laughs> Some of the times we get we get a name from our spiritual master that indicates some of the qualities that that per, that personality has. So a spiritual master will sometimes very carefully observe their disciples, and they will see that they they show certain characteristics. Of a, of a great personality and a certain manifestation of their own activity. And so that will be given as a name like that. So that's fine. You may also exhibit some of the features of a great personality by your own character, by your own personality, or by the way you do things. And that is nice. And sometimes we give names based on that. That's, a lot of times we do. But to think I'm that person or I'm an expansion of that person is a whole different thing. <laughs> That's cheating. And it's pretentious, it's, uh, it's, it's my about. Okay, so we get in this description. And here, how she was dressed, what was her features, uh, how she was working, how she was perspiring. And the beautiful flowers in the hair of Mother Yusoda and how they were falling to the ground as she was serving Krishna. And this is a meditation for anyone who wants to develop the motherly affection through Ratsaya Ras. Okay, we'll stop there and open it up. Thank you so much, Marco. Such a sweet class. As, as he was speaking and describing the boiling milk, I was wondering and I was thinking how everything had conscious at that time. Even the milk had conscious. Oh my God, Mother Shoda is ignoring me. I'm being neglected. There was such a very sweet uh, 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 pastime. And I, I was just thinking that that is so sweet that everything at that time had conscious and they were so aware. And that was a very nice story. So thank you for sharing that, Maharaj. Would like to ask you if what is if any questions, any comments, any clarification, please uh, do unmute yourself or you can just, and or raise your hand, sorry, because we have at least 25 people online and we don't want to miss anybody out. So please uh, do raise your hand and we'll call upon you. Marge, I have a question, Marge, as you were speaking about um, the spiritual master, when the spiritual master names the disciple, uh, can, we they, back, can we go back to the gallery? Oh, I'm sorry, Marge. Sure. 
Yes, we can do that. There we go. And if devotees can please um, turn on their videos so that at least, you know, if possible, that would be nice to have each other's association. Um, March, when, when, when spiritual masters name their disciples, um, I've come across situations where when, the, when we are given a new name, that is our second birth. So we should be addressed as that. Um, how I've come across situations where devotees still call other devotees with their non-devotee name after five kings of practice. Is that okay? Non-devotee name? What, what does that mean? They're, they're For names? example, if Srimati calls me by, by my birth name as opposed to Anasuya. Does people do that? I, yeah, 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 yes, Mar. <laughs> really, I'm, I'm surprised. I've never, I've never. Me seen too, it. Marge. Marge, me too. But I've come across, and, and it's such a new thing to me, and and I have to find myself nicely, kind, kindly, as much as I can, correct them. But yes, I, and even um, husband and wife, who I initiated, rather than calling. You know, like rather than me calling Prickshit Prickshit, I'm calling by his Carmi name. And I'm thinking, wait, why are you doing that? Is that okay, no. Maharaj? No. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make sure that, that the, I'm not making any offenses when I correct them. <laughs> no, it's not okay. I know devotees will sometimes shorten a, a devotee's spiritual name. It's like you know, the name is... Uh, uh, Ananda Mai, we call it, hey Ananda. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take the first word. Or, uh, so, or sometimes they use, uh, what, what's some of the more flippant ways we do it? Let's see. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of. Uh, hmm. For certain names that you can kind of really shorten and make a and make a nickname out of it. <laughs> Guru Maharaj, I've been called Sukha so many times since of Sukhava. Let me call you Suki. Oh yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, my my dad's sister who we named Sukhava, we used to call her Suki. <laughs> In Vrindavan, right, Maharaj? Yeah, yeah, she's there. We call. Her. Sometimes we would we make would say Suki. Hey, Suki. <laughs> <laughs> that was affectionate. It wasn't done in it <laughs> like that. But, and that's all right. <laughs> that's cute, actually. <laughs> but sometimes devoted into the nickname thing. Mm. Like uh, instead of saying, uh, like there's one devotee, his name is Prema Morti. Because we say we'll say, "Hey, pray." Mm. Instead of saying "pray Morty, we'll say, "Hey, pray." Yeah. There's one devotee here, March. He's a disciple of uh, Bhakti Swami, and his name is Naveen Sham. And we just say, "Hey, Naveen," <laughs> cut the Sham out. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's. That's not so bad, but when we start changing the name around, that's going to become something else. So. Yeah, because I was concerned, Mark, because I've noticed, you know, like rather than, you know, like, it, like, like some, uh, my thoughts, much, and again, let me know if I'm thinking wrongly. Like um, in a devoted community, I, I think the only time that as devotees that we use our birth name, our karma, in like a better word, is when we're that's in a working a field. I think that's an insult. That's what I'm thinking too. Yes. It's an insult. What you're really you're really criticizing the person by saying and using their karma name again. Mm. You're bringing it down back to their material status or trying to see and act in that way. I, that that's offensive, I think. I'm making this points, Marsh, because I have to fix that situation. <laughs> Uh, bringing it down to the Marsh, can you say it again? Bring, bringing it down to the I, I missed the last. Hey, bring it down to the mundane, to the ordinary. Okay, okay, okay. When you 
like in husband and wife relationship, according to the Vedic standard of calling, a wife calls her husband Prabhu. Mm -hmm. Say her name, his name. To say his name really is becoming too familiar. Mm. And a husband calls a wife Devi. Mm. She is referred to Devi as goddess. The husband is called Prabhu as master. And I know one couple, a very nice couple, and they follow that very carefully. He always calls his wife Devi, she always calls him Prabhu. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it, this calling helps to keep the respect because in the relationship with husband and wife, you could drag a date down to the ordinary. And one of the ways to keep you away from the ordinary is by referring to each other in a very uh, respectful way. How we speak is an indication of how we really are relating to that person. Mm -hmm. Now, unless you're from New York, it applies. <laughs> New Yorkers have their own way of doing things, cannot be copied by anybody. <laughs> they have a flair, Mara, and stick their own flair. <laughs> uh, I won't go into the, to the logistics of that one because that's the long. <laughs> the New Yorkers have a way of addressing each other that is full of affection internally. And externally looks like something different. <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> but for those of you who don't know anything about New York, don't worry, you're not missing anything. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Maharaj. Thank you for thank you really for addressing that and clarifying that for me because yeah. All, all, all kidding aside, that's very important. How we address each other is how we really relate to each other. Thank you, Maharaj. That really helps me. This has been on my mind for quite some time. So somehow the, the Lord's arrangement, this topic came in the class, and I said, this is a perfect time to ask this question. Thank you so much. Sometimes the spiritual master would get very friendly with the disciple. But the disciples should not take that friendliness as a way to become friendly from his side to the spiritual man. And also, Marsh, wouldn't that also be like, I, I'm thinking, I, I don't know, but if the spiritual master has given a name to the disciple and other devotees do not call that disciple by that name, isn't that much also um, disrespecting the spiritual master of who gave that name to the disciple? Say again, I miss you. And there's a poop kind of in the background. And I'm, <laughs> Peacock. Marsh, so um, when the guru, when, when the spiritual master gives a name to the disciple, a new name, you know, and the devotees do not call that person with a new name, isn't that also like disrespecting the spiritual master who gave the name, Maharaj? Why wouldn't they do that? I mean, um, they're, they're always happy that we always ask, what is your new name? And we, we always appreciate that. Anyway, that's not a it's not proper attitude. I don't know anybody who does that. I don't know where you are. <laughs> yeah, where I am. Yeah, some. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying to fix. That's why I thought I'd, I'd, I'd rather ask you for clarification and maybe before I make offenses. <laughs> yeah. Mm. The titles and the addressment according to titles is a sense of honor, a sense of respect. If we don't keep that, we, we have a tendency to lose respect for that person. Mm. As soon as you lose respect, you break the relationship. Thank you, Maharaj. Helps a lot. See, I'm sorry. Bhakti Vinod Thakur very illustrates this point. He says, 
somehow or other, I live in this world because I give respect to all living entities. Mm. That's one of the most important principles of Vaishnav culture is to give respect. Mm. And how that respect is given is according to the, to the interaction with the people. But there is always an etiquette in that in the proper way to offer instruction. Thank you so much, Marsh, for really clarifying this on my mind. Really, really helps a lot. <laughs> Mother Sri Devi, go ahead. Thank you, Anasuya. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to the beautiful pastime of Mother Yashoda. Continuing on the uh, topic of name, I have been given the spiritual name Sri Devi Dasi. But my family will still call me Lakshmi. Somehow, I don't know why, I, even though I have told them many times, my name is Sri Devi Dasi, they will still call me Lakshmi. For example, my father will call me Lakshmi. My, I mean, just, I'm just giving an example. So now what, they, what to do in such cases? Because that's the familiarity there. Now, for, for parents, it's okay. They're just, they're just used to the name they give you. They can't see you in another, any other way. It's not, a, it's, they're not gonna, they're not demeaning you by saying that. It's just the way parents are. And since your name, we also give the name Lakshmi to people in initiation too. So it's, it's nice. Okay, Guru I was wondering because when I heard Anusya saying it's disrespectful to those spiritual masters. Okay. Don't worry about correcting your parents, that's fine. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. It's just the way they are, you know. Even though we see that in even Western parents, they still tend to call their child occasionally by their given name. It's just the way parents are. They, they're attached in that way. Mm. Okay. Thank you so much. There's no disrespect in that. Right, right. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that. I really needed to hear that because I got worried when Anusya said is saying, is that offense to the spiritual master who gave your spiritual name? Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's fine. I think next was Srimati, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, go ahead, Srimati. Um, yeah, one second. Uh, please um, take Namrata Mataji. I'll, I'll come later. Okay, Namrata Mataji, please go ahead. Okay. Hare Krishna. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your Holy Spirit, Maharaj. So, uh, my, my question was regarding the mood. <clears throat> mood of bhakti. So, I am just uh, 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 taking a, a story from another uh, uh, part of Bhagavatam so, uh, to just clarify that. That Kartam Rishi, being the father of the Supreme Lord, <clears throat> sorry, Kartam Rishi, being the father of the Supreme Lord, wanted to serve Supreme Lord in the da uh, Dasya Bhav, as he had always done. So uh, after he finished his uh, duties as a Grihastha, he retired. So I was just thinking that if he was uh, given. Uh, the Supreme Lord was his own son. Then it, uh, can the devotees choose the mood uh, for the bhakti? Or they are, uh, as Kardam Rishi was already given Vatsalya, uh, Vatsalya Bhav, uh, as uh, he was a son, uh, he, he had a son as Supreme Lord. So I, I, I was just thinking that way. Well, the mood of dasya is in every is in everything anyway. Everything is dasya. When you're in whatever whatever rasa you're in, dasya is the mood anyway. You serve in, in vatsalya, you serve in madhurya, you serve in 
Sakya and you serve. That Dasya is always there. But Dasya in, in itself is just the mood of service that is distinct from the other ones. But every but every rasa has that but has dasya in it. Except neutrality. Neutrality doesn't have dasya in it. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with, you know, his mood is what he 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 fathered the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But you'll see he didn't have as soon as the son was born, he never performed but Ras. He left. And he left his he left the Supreme Lord with the mother. And he went. So his mood was actually but Ras. He never really performed but Sayuran. He didn't father, uh, you know, Kapilavas at all. So Guru Maharaj, he he took he was detached to this thing and he just took it as a duty. That is it. He wanted a wife. It was it's a mysterious mystery mystery why he wanted a wife, but he wanted a wife, although he was already fixed in full devotional activity. Still, he wanted to get married. So this was the arrangement of the Supreme Lord to bring about the incarnation of Kapila Dev. And he, he married the most qualified lady at the time, Satarupi. She is the ideal wife. She followed her husband completely. Although she taught, she was much more qualified than her husband. She was the daughter of Swayam Bhuva Manu. She grew up in a very aristocratic Vaishnav family. Her father was the one of the Manus who sets down the principles of religion for the different millenniums. And she grew up very devotional and very aristocratic in her, her life. She had all wealth. And when she married this uh, Kardama Muni, she had to give up everything and live like a like a poor vagabond. <laughs> she had nothing. She was performing austerities. She was so lean and skinny, she wasn't even eating right. <laughs> but she followed her husband because the duty of the wife is not to try to be better than the husband. Although she was more qualified than she was from the material point of view, but from the spiritual point of view, he was more qualified and she followed him and she relinquished all of her opulence just to take a lesser position in relationship to her husband. Gandhari did that with Vidarashtra also. She, she could see, but she voluntarily blinded herself not to be better than her husband. So these ladies are considered to be ideal in Vaishnav culture because although they had so many superior and amazing qualities, they gave them up just to serve their husband in a lesser, lesser position. And Satarupi did that. And because of that, she was awarded the Supreme Personality of the Godhead as her son. And when the child was born, that child stayed with his mother. I mean, he, he was the Supreme Lord. He could have left, but he didn't. He stayed to teach his mother. He wanted to give his mother uh, to reciprocate her pure devotion to her husband, who was a well, great, a great renunciate, her Dhamma Muni. So that, that particular pastime is very indicative of what is the perfect wife. And to show his love for her, his wife when she was in such a, what we say, he, he, he had some maidservants taking care of her because she was emaciated. She wasn't even eating properly. She was just in a very, very decrepit situation. But she followed her husband nicely, and he rewarded her by creating this aerial mansion. 
and he took her on the Ariel Mansion, and he went, she went flying through the sky. And Prabhupada said, no one can create an Ariel Mansion like her Muni. He was such a mystic that we, I mean, it was the size of a city, and it was able to fly in the air and go anywhere and everywhere and had all the luxuries in, on board. So he did that just to reciprocate his wife's devotion to him. And then to further that, he gave her that son. And then, of course, the teachings of Kapila Dev to Devahutu make up the science of devotional service, which is mentioned in at least six or seven chapters in the, tenth, in the third canto. I hope that helped them, Rita. Yes, thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think that's a very important lesson yes. I learned that uh, even uh, if a wife is having better qualities than her husband, uh, she she should at times take the uh, lower position. I, am I right? Yeah, because the husband will will appreciate that, and then he will be, he'll give more attention and affection to his wife. If she thinks he thinks if she's trying to act better than him or show off better than him, he'll turn the other way. Especially if a wife tries to instruct her husband, it doesn't matter what she's instructing him in, he won't do it. Just to show that, just to show that it's not the you know, a male, a man's ego gets when we say crashed when he gets instructed by his wife. But a woman has to know her husband and communicate things that are helpful for her husband when he's not aware of it without telling him. And you have to learn that science. And I don't think I have to say anything about that because the women know how to do that. I don't. It's a fact. You have to know how to control your husband without letting him know you're controlling him. <laughs> and if you tell him what to do, it's the worst thing because that emasculates him. And when a husband becomes subordinate to his wife, he becomes a wimp. And other men don't even want to be around him. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. I think this is a very subtle time of a marriage life or of a grihastha life. So, <laughs> thank you very much. If you, want right. further knowledge, if you want further knowledge of this subject matter, just contact Sri Dodi. He can he deals with this all the time. But she has, she has realized this on the highest platform of realization also. Yes, Guru Maharaj, she has already given me one valuable advice regarding Grihastha life. So yes, the other droplets are yet to be taken from her. I'm looking forward for that. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you for such a nice question. And yes, it's, it's a lot of work, Maharaj. It is... I. I I, and uh, you know, just to communicate to the husband without him knowing that we are trying to overtake is literally a meditation in itself. <laughs> Seriously. But, but women are equipped with that shakti automatically. <laughs> they just have to know how to awaken it and fine tune it. <laughs> <laughs> so true, Marj. Thank you so much. Uh, Srimati, please go ahead, Prabhu. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, Guru Maharaj, I just want to continue that topic, like um, calling with your initiated name, as I was recently, as I'm recently initiated. So many people doesn't know that I got initiated and still they call with my Karmi name uh, in, the, in the local congregation. And sometimes uh, I don't know how to correct them. <laughs> So sometimes I say that, um, yeah, I got initiated and this is my name. But even then, next time they saw, they see me, they call me my Karmi name only. 
they say that they don't remember these um, initiated names. They are very tough to remember. <laughs> Not many <laughs> excuses they give. So it's like it is. These are not devotees that are calling you that, right? Devotees only, Guru Maharaj, uh, in the uh, temple. Devotees only. Devotees too? Yes, Guru Maharaj, yeah. Oh, devotees, devotees have devotees know devotee names. Why should they say it's so difficult? Yeah, they don't say, they say that they, they can't, they don't remember it quickly. So that's why they call me my uh, karmi name sometimes but it's a little awkward for me but i'm trying to i can understand if it's coming from someone who's not a devotee or when someone who is a devotee their names also have been changed right some of them yeah um, yes yes guru Maharaj, yeah because i got rejected. they say that uh, you got uh, initiated in covid and uh, you were not initiated here in dallas so we don't know that you are initiated, all that they'll say. Oh, yeah. uh, if somebody says that, they're, they're ignorant. You don't even want to talk to such things. <laughs> <laughs> during COVID. All right. So COVID stream over Bhakti, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm like in confusion state sometimes, like how to correct them. I don't want to offend them or uh, talk rudely or talk like that. So oh, well, when, when I call you by your, your other name, just, just make believe you didn't hear anything. That's all. <laughs> and, don't, and only respond when they call you by your regular name. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, both my, my daughters, Maharaj, like, slip of a tongue if i were to call them vishaka and not Brajakopi, she won't answer me she, and she told me mom i'm not going to re respond to you until you use my devotee name so that's so this this <laughs> my both my kids train are, are training me that if if i call them by their birth name they won't answer until i call them by the initial then only they'll answer so that's a trick that they taught me which is working <laughs> Raj, vishaka has become Brajagopi. And, and Brenda, Manoharini Vrinda. Manoharini. Oh, Vrinda is still there. Right? Mm. Yeah, both of them have it much, actually. The, uh, uh, Vrinda is Manoharini Vrinda, and Vishaka is Raja Gopi Vishaka. But if I call them, so they both have their birth name at the end, but they but rather rather than calling Raja Gopi, I, she says, just call me Raja, like what you were saying just now, much like just the first half of the initiated name. And then for Mano Harini, you know, some call her Mano, some call her Mano Harini, some call her Harini. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, I think they, they're, they're happy that they receive their names and they really, really want to really be known by their new names. So I think that's nice if you can, remember to call them that way oh yes my they are definitely helping me to remember every single day <laughs> they remember they remind me and it's working so that can be a trick that you can try Srimati. oh yeah. actually what i was thinking march is like is it okay march if someone calls us by a karmi name and we say to them can you please call me Srimati? i mean can we say that nicely march no i sometimes people will call me Hey Prabhu, they call me Prabhu. They won't say my name or they won't say Maharaj or Swami or anything. And I, I don't even, I don't mind. I just, I respond because I know they're talking to me. But sometimes when I don't respond immediately, they correct. They, they as soon as they say it, they realize it's they're not not the right address. They actually correct themselves. But I don't, I don't correct people. I just let it go on, whatever people say. Namrata, sorry, go, go ahead, Srimati, go ahead. Uh, Gurma, should I do the same uh, with everyone? Um, uh, no need to mention them or correct them. Um, like, please call me with my uh, initiated name. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't correct people. Okay. I don't. Anyway, you can you can decide what to do, but as soon as you start correcting people, you break down 
in communication right there. Yes, Guru. Yeah, that's what I feel. That's why I'm not yeah. doing much at all. Yeah. And then your, your old name is the same meaning as your new name. The meaning is the same, practically. Yeah. Except he expands the meaning into different areas. It's more broader in the in the opulences. And Lavanya is just one way. Lavanya is a nice name. I mean, there's even devotees who have been named Lavanya. That, that's a given spiritual name by the by gurus. Yes, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even let it. I, I wouldn't bother with them. But that's up to you. That's good, Yeah. Thank you, Gurmaj. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Namrata, go ahead. Uh, uh, sorry, Gurmaj. Just a quick, quick clarification. Uh, so, Gurmaj, in the temple, many times. People call even females as Prabhu. I am just wondering, is it right or wrong? I'm only amongst devotees. We can't call a uh, Prabhupada in a couple of letters referred to certain initiated devotees as Prabhu mm, women. And then I mean I explored that one. I thought it was an, uh, something that was outside of the etiquette. But one senior devotee, he explained it to me that within the category of, or within the confines of devotional service, when you refer to a person as Prabhu, you put yourself in the position of servant. And uh, well, that refers to women also. So to, to say Malati Prabhu or Vishaka Prabhu, uh, Anasuya Prabhu is not wrong. It's actually a title of respect, but it's not used so much. Prabhupada did it about three or four times in letters, and he also did it in person a couple of times. But then it can't be done with devotees, persons who are not initiated, you can't say, well, you know, um, you know Carol Prabhu or Susan Prabhu or, you know, like that. You can only do it with, with spiritual means. I am not initiated yet, so can I correct them? I mean, should I tell them or not? Somehow, uh, I really feel awkward when they call me Prabhu. I mean, I just let it go. <laughs> I mean, I'm not into correcting people when they would dress me one way or the other, but some devotees may feel like necessary. I don't. Get involved with it. So you have to decide. Namrata is a name that is a, a purely spiritual name. It means the jewel of the holy name. That's what it means. The holy name as the as the as the jewel. Therefore, when you get initiated, it's the most difficult name to deal with. <laughs> How to change that name. Just like we have one devotee who was, he's a kirtan ear. And when he was young, living in Mauritius, uh, one guru gave him the name Madhava. And now he became probably the most famous kirtanir in the world is named is Madhava. He travels all around the world with his kirtan. And he's been known as Madhava. And even when he was associating with spiritual masters, you know, he was always known as Madhava, but he was never initiated. But some, but one spiritual master 
out of an affection when he was small, gave him the name Madara. So the name stuck. Now, at the time of his initiation, the spiritual master didn't change his name. He kept the name Madara, just the way it was. Didn't add anything to it. Didn't take anything away. John, Johnny from uh, from uh, Johnny is a famous kirtan singer. Now she's famous throughout the world for her kirtan. London for Guru Ma. Yeah, from London. Pump. And uh, her name was Johnny. Johnny. She grew up in a Krishna conscious family. Mother and father are both exemplary devotees. And uh, she got initiated and Radha Swami initiated and gave her Janava Jivani. We actually, which is the light, which means the life of Janava. Janava Jivani. We actually gave, we took her name to a higher level. The same name Janava wasn't changed. It was actually accelerated and more glorifiable by giving her the name Janava Jivani. Jivani means life. Or one who gives life. So one who gives life to Janava. So that's beautiful. Yes, indeed. So thank you, Gumar. I think uh, even I should not correct uh, anybody as uh, it is anyways decided in the uh, you know, devotee circle that Prabhu can be a term, but um, a little, uh, you know, uh, the subtle thing which is bothering me, I think I should write you in the mail. So, no issue. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I just, just don't correct anybody. They can call me, hey, you know, just, all right, they're calling me. If they call me hay, I say, well, hay is outside, it's for the cows. It's for something. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Go right ahead, Mother Sri Devi. Thank you, Anisuya. Uh, dear Guru Maharaj, on this question of, you know, people not doing the right thing, I want to know, in front of the deities, I have seen people turn their back, put their mobile phones up, and take a selfie of themselves with the back to the deity. So, this is an offense to turn your back to the deity. So, when I see this, I immediately say, Prabhu or Mataji, this is not good. This is offensive to the Lord to take a picture with your back to the deity. But at the same time, the instruction in Nectar of Devotion is one should not correct or instruct anyone in front of the deity. But when the deity of the Lord is being insulted, how is it that one can keep quiet? Well, I've done it and I've seen other senior devotees very nicely, carefully, and gently. Uh, what I would do is I, I indicate with my hand, that I go like this, pointing to the back. Don't put your back to the deity. I don't speak. I indicate that it's not, they're, they're not in the right position. So I don't say anything. When you speak, you could also be, you could also be a little bit too heavy and critical in front of the deity. But I've seen senior devotees wave their hands by motioning people to move away from the deity. I do it all the time because I see that happening also. People do it. But if you do it in a very careful way, nice way, you don't even have to speak. Just indicate that where they're standing is, is um, not right. So it's up to you to do it in the right way. That will make the difference. You don't want to cause any 
any discord and if they don't do it then what can you do like just recently i was in slovenia and there was this guy who was taking photos of the there was a wedding going on and i was there and he had his back to the deity so i very carefully indicated to the other devotees to tell him to move away from the deity and um, he did for a while but then he just kind of drifted back so after that i didn't say anything he was a guest Uh, you have to use discretion in how to do things without making it worse simply by your correction. Mm -hmm. so, yes, Maharaj, actually, in India, I have seen that people come, they stand with their back to the DT, they hold their mobile phone like this, and they take a picture with their back to the DT. No. Hurry, Bo. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? No. Not right. It's wrong. We know to show your back to the deity is considered an offense, but you have to somehow or other not worsen the situation by making a scene out of it. <laughs> If they don't listen, then you might also go to the temple authority and say, this, this is the situation. And let, let that person deal with it. It's for their benefit. You may get upset, but you can't, you can't act in an upset way. Right, right. I can see that. That's where perhaps, not perhaps, that's where I did go wrong today. One person was with a nice big garland and standing and taking photos. And I said, Prabhu, this is not good. You're, you know, with your back to the deity. And another person who was a devotee is telling me, shh. Keep quiet, keep quiet. It's okay, it's okay. He's with me. I'll take care of it. And then I realized this person is a big donor and he's been garlanded and welcomed and this and that. So anything goes because he has money. So he's given special privilege of taking a picture with his back to the deity because he's a big donor. The person told me, Shh, it's okay, keep quiet. He's with me, I'm taking care of him. He made signs to me that keep quiet, don't say anything. It's okay, I'm dealing with him. And he allowed him to do it. Sukhava, you have a question. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shila Prabhupada, all glories to your lotus feet. Uh, actually, in, in connection to same topic, uh, upsetting devotees. Sometimes uh, I have seen senior devotees saying stuff to uh, the newcomer who comes first time to the temple. Sometimes they stand in the wrong queue. Sometimes they are taking darshan in the wrong way. And then that, you know, uh, I have even heard saying them that I'm not coming back to this temple. You know, everywhere people are just telling you off and uh, they're not letting us do what we want yeah. to do. In what to do in that scenario, Guru Maharaj. It's like you, you try to correct. I'll tell you a story. Mm. The story is that there was one, this was when the movement was quite young. This happened in Europe. There was one lady, she came, and she was a, a guest, and she came with a mini skirt on. And she came in front of the deity with a mini skirt. So the devotee said, well, you know, we welcome you here, but you can't come in front of the Lord dressed like that. Yeah. She didn't like that. 
And, but she liked coming, so she came back again and put her mini skirt on. And this time the devotees were again reminding her. Still, she didn't listen. She came back a third time. This time the devotees gave really heavy with her. And then she said, well, I'm not coming back anymore. So just a little bit after that, Prabhupada came to the temple. And then she learned that there, that Prabhupada was coming. So she wanted to come and meet Srila Prabhupada. There was a gathering when Prabhupada was there. So she came, same way. Minister, right down, sitting in front of Prabhupada with her minister. All her hair was all fixed up with all kinds of makeup. And Prabhupada looked at her when she walked in and said, oh, thank you for coming. Well, welcome to our temple. He said, oh, you oh, he said, oh, you look very nice today. Yeah, he said that. Oh, you look very nice. He actually complimented her. She was like in tears. She was so old moved by Prabhupada's kindness. He didn't look at the external, he was seeing the soul. Mm -hmm. That night, she went back home and took off down her makeup and came to the temple again without the mini skirt. She said, if this pleases the, the devotees, then, uh, then I'll do that. It was Prabhupada's uh, spiritual power and kindness. Oh, you look very nice today. Thank you for coming. That's what he said. That was his best words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we shouldn't heavy people out because they don't know the etiquette or they're new people. Or they're, this is not Krishna consciousness. What are you gaining by doing that? Nothing. You're just destroying the preaching. That's all you're doing. So we follow the example, and if it becomes a, a, a nuisance, then you can just make some indication to the temple authorities that this is going on and let them handle it. That's their service. They're meant to handle such situations. Chitabha, where'd you go? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I, I, uh, my connection, dot, I lost connection, Brumana, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we have, you know, in Bhaktivedanta Manor, all things go on there. There was one, uh, one lady who was standing in front of the deities, right, in front of the altar of Bhaktivedanta Manor. And she had her two children when they were young, so they saw Gornet Thai. So they said, Mommy, who is these two? And she said, Oh, that is Love and Kus. <laughs> love and Kus were the two sons of, you know, of, uh, you know, Sat, 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 who was it? You know, Sati, and not Sati, but uh, Sita and Ram. One lady, she was standing there, she heard the whole thing. <laughs> And she said, no, it's not love and kus. It's Lord Chaitanya and Lord Vishnu. <laughs> so Prabhupada wanted people to come and learn. He said our temples should be not just places where people come to see the deities, but it's educational center. So we must have classes, we must have special classes for new devotees so they can learn both the philosophy and the etiquette. You're on mute. Sukabaha, you're on mute. We are still on mute, Mother. Yeah. There you go. Um, sorry. Uh, on one, once um, at Bhaktivedanta Manor in the morning arti, we ladies stand on the left and the men stand on the right hand side. And there was there was uh, one family came 
uh, I think the son was old, but he had some sort of a mental problem. And uh, they, they were sitting, standing together in the ladies, I, ladies side. Uh, a senior devotee from the other side came and said, you should not be standing here. You should go there. As soon as that person left, the mother, the, child, the, the son looked at the mom and mom said, okay, let's go back. And they left Arti and they were about to leave literally the temple room. So I, I ran after them and I said, sorry, I think uh, there's some misunderstanding. Normally it happens, but you can still stand here and take a darshan because I realized that son had a mental disability and he could not stand alone in the man's side. So, you know, I, I feel that we should be very careful when we say something to the people that don't do this. Okay, following... Uh, discipline is must but sometimes it is I, I i feel we should leave it isn't it guru Maharaj? what do you think yeah yeah you know, you know, devotees have a tendency to have new people out That's, i made that mistake once in italy and i had to profusely apologize to the lady she was wrong she was dancing on the men's side during the kirtan and i was just feeling a little awkward being around. And so I kind of indicated that she should go on the other side and it didn't work. She became really offended. But in that case, that should have been done by the ladies, the senior ladies who said, you know, come and dance with us and you're there. They should have done it. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we have a tendency to uh, we have to be really sensitive to new people or even people who have been around for a little while and just don't know. Thank you like, very much. Hare Krishna. Bhakti One thing in Bhakti Vedanta manner that happens all the time. All the time, yeah. People stand in front of Prabhupada and when they take darshan of the deities, right? Mm, they do. Yeah. Yeah. Many times I will I will very I won't say anything, I just indicate with my hands to make an eye over a problem and I go mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And people usually respond to that. But that's that happens in many temples. Prabhupada is just people are standing in front of Prabhupada. Sometimes mm -hmm. yes, with their back to Prabhupada. <laughs> yeah. True. But, you know, the temple authorities should be on top of these things. And it's not for the general devotees to get involved with directing people. The temple authorities have that responsibility to keep things moving in the right direction. Mm. There's no indication that ladies should stand over here so that people who, have, who are new will know that, okay, this is for ladies section, this is the man section, you know, something like that would be good, good help. Yeah, I wouldn't want to talk clear about that. Did, mm -hmm. that. did they come back after you told them? I haven't seen them, right? but that time they stayed at least for the Arti. I could manage to do that, the, at least they stayed. And it was actually the son's birthday. And they came first time for his birthday to the temple as well. She talked to me afterwards and she said it was his birthday and he really wanted to come somewhere nice. And we came here that, you know, let's let's take a darshan, which was, I it would have been bad if they would have left without like doing the arti. That would have been really, really, really horrible. Yeah. Did a good service, you know. Lucky that devotee didn't come back and try it again. <laughs> Maybe they must have come back, but I may not have seen them. Yeah. No, I mean that devotee who... who oh, yeah, them, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he didn't try again, did he? Hmm? Uh, saying that, Guru Maharaj, I've seen that person doing this quite often to the people, offending them, and, and, and the... And she's senior devotee as well, so I couldn't. I I didn't say anything to her. Basically, mm. 
it was a difficult situation. I don't know. I mean, how Prabhupada treated guests was completely different than how he dealt with the voters. Mm -hmm. But Guru Maharaj, I, can't, I, I couldn't say anything because she is such a senior devotee as well to her, like, you know, I don't know. Yeah, well, you did your best. Yeah, I, I, that's why I said I'll, I will take care of those newcomers, which is more, more helpful than saying anything to other person. Yeah, it's good if you have somebody like you around to help new people. Because a lot of times if you just talk to new people, they really feel welcome. A lot of times new people will come and nobody will talk to them. Um. When we spot a new person, we should immediately greet them and welcome them. Thank them for coming. Even this experience was there today. This time, I, um, Sunday was the first day of Karthik. Uh, I went to uh, Trafalgar Square. We had a, there was a Diwali festival, and we had a table for offering candle. And uh, loads and loads of devotees came to offer the candle and we thanked them all. And they, were, they felt so nice that they, they said, okay, give us the address, we'll come back, come to, the, you come to your temple, come to your temple. Loads of people took the leaflets and stuff. You know? It was a nice mm -hmm. experience. Good, good, thank you. Nice. Okay, I think we should- Thank end. you, Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Thank you, Sitaba. Okay, we're gonna have to end this uh, again. Thank you so much, thank you. for such a wonderful, you, wonderful Mother. class. And thank you to all the, the, the devotees for joining us. One Chakrapati Biascha, Kripa Sindha Vevacha, Patita Nampava Nevya, Vaishnavevya Namo, Namahashila Prabhupada Ki, Solanus Chandramali Swami Ki, Jai. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.